Hey friends, it's good to be with you again. My name is Ricky James, a senior pastor at First United Methodist Church here in Clinton, Mississippi. And whether you're joining us online or listening to us at Super Talk FM, we're excited and glad that you're here with us as we're continuing our sermon series on the Apostles' Creed, a foundational statement of belief of who we are and what we believe as Christians. Today we're looking at the next line that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. We're going to talk about who Pilate is, what he represents, and how we as Christians are called to live differently because Jesus, not only did he die, but he defeated death itself. So thanks for joining us as we worship together. Welcome. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt to the King 
you join me in our affirmation of faith with the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So friends, I want to say thank you yet again for your generosity. The way that you support our ministry by your gifts really does empower us not only to continue what we've been doing, but to look ahead and to really get excited about what God is doing in and through the ministry at First United Methodist Church. So I want to just encourage you to continue to give as you're able to do. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. You can give right now safely and securely from where you are at firstmethodistclinton.org slash giving. You can mail your check to us at 100 Mount Salus Road here in Clinton, or just drop it by the church next time in the neighborhood. We'd love for you to see, see us, and we'd love for you to see you as well, so stop by and say hello. But it, however you give, thank you, and remember, it makes an eternal difference.
Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're joining us today. I'm Miss Nikki, and we're going to have a few moments for the kids. Over the past few weeks, we've been learning about some of our beliefs. So far, we learned that God is our Father, and He created heaven and earth. Jesus is His Son, our Lord, and we also learned that Jesus' mother was Mary, and that she lived her life as one of God's servants, saying yes to God and living His will. Today, we'll learn about another belief, that Jesus suffered, He was crucified, dead, and buried. Crucified means to put someone to death by nailing or binding them to a cross. I brought this little cross with me today. This cross is an important symbol for Christians because Jesus died on the cross. So during the time of when the Bible was written, people who had done very bad things, like criminals, they were killed on crosses. It was a horrible way to be punished. Jesus was not a bad person, and He didn't do bad things, and He didn't deserve to die on the cross, but He did it because of His great love for us and for God. It was all part of God's plan. It's a very sad story, but it helps us to love Jesus even more when we see the pain that He went through so that we can be forgiven for our sins. Toward the end of Jesus' life, there were some really mean people who wanted to hurt Jesus. And they beat Him, they spit on Him, and they mocked Him. The word mock means that they teased him and they laughed at him. After mocking him, the soldiers led Jesus out to be crucified. They were going to nail him to a cross. And Jesus was put in a lot of pain for being beaten, and he knew that soon he was going to die. And then he had to carry his cross too, which was way bigger than Jesus, and it was very heavy. And they led him out to a place called Golgotha. Here at Golgotha, they crucified Jesus the Son of God, and the King of the Jews. They nailed him to the cross, and they lifted it up for all to see. And when the hour came, they took him down, they wrapped his body in cloths, and they put him in a tomb, and they rolled a large stone in front of the opening to seal it. This is the saddest part of Jesus' life, when he died. But remember that he did not stay dead. He conquered death and sin. But we'll learn more about that next week. Jesus' entire life was about obeying God. He continued to trust God even through all the things that led up to His death. As He made the long journey to die on the cross, He had plenty of opportunities and reasons to disobey God, but He remained obedient to God's will for His life. And because Jesus died on the cross, we can be forgiven of our sins and have a relationship with God. No matter what others do to us or how mean someone might be to us, we can still be God's obedient servant, just like Jesus. And that's the good news for today. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to earth to die for our sins. Help us follow his example by trusting you and serving others even when we face struggles. Give us the assurance and faith that we need to trust in your will for our own lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Won't you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, I'm going to talk about religion, politics, and hell. Well, if I do this poorly, a lot of you will be offended. If I do it well, you might be confused. If I do it really well, I might even challenge myself a bit. Because that's the thing about good sermons. I think a really good sermon should challenge anyone who hears it, even the preacher. And so today, I'm going to talk about something that might be a little bit controversial. And it's probably not even that I said hell in the sermon. I want to talk about an intersection between 
religion and politics that is at the heart of the Christian story. There in the middle of the Apostles' Creed that we're studying over these few weeks is a statement that is actually a political statement. We say in the Apostles' Creed that we believe that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. Last week we talked about Mary and the fact that Mary is one of two people named in the Creed, two humans who find a place of importance in this foundational statement of our faith. The other person is Pontius Pilate. And growing up, I had to confess that I really didn't think about who Pilate was outside of the story of Jesus' crucifixion. But when we proclaim that Jesus suffered under a man named Pontius Pilate, we actually find ourselves square in the middle of a centuries-old struggle over who controls the land that we've come to call the Middle East. And no matter who should be in control of that land or who we think should be in control, what was very clear is that in Jesus' day, Rome was in control. And so much of Jesus' ministry takes place against the backdrop of this struggle between the people of Israel and their Roman occupiers. And so to say that the foundational statement of our Christian theology places Pontius Pilate at the center of that story of struggle is worth exploring. And that's what we're going to do this morning. But you might, like I did when I was a kid, wonder, who's Pilate? And where did he come from? So here's a little bit about Pilate's backstory. Pilate was born in Italy and was a part of a wealthy military family. He was a member of what the Romans called the equestrian class, kind of the middle class of the upper Roman authority. You had the aristocracy, you had the equestrians, and then you had everybody else. <laughs> and the equestrians were the group of what we might think of as knights. They were the military families of the Roman Empire. They were expected not only to serve in the Roman legions, but to lead them, to become the great captains and generals of the Roman army. And so Pilate, from a very young age, would have been raised with the idea that he was going to serve the empire through a sword, and that he would help defend and expand the empire's reign throughout the world. He obviously had a lot of success because at the age, or in the year rather, of 26 AD, he was made the prefect of the Roman province of Judea. Now, the Roman province of Judea is what we think of as uh, the Middle East or the Bible lands, the holy lands of Jesus' time. And what's interesting about that is as prefect, as a governor of this province, he was responsible for overseeing all that went on. But Judea didn't really have a lot of its own wealth or produce, so to speak. Rather, the reason it was so important is that it controlled the land and sea routes to Egypt. And Egypt was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And so whoever controlled Judea controlled access to Egypt. And so you can see the importance of this uh, land in the Roman Empire and why over the time of their conquering they decided to put one of their own generals in charge of this land. But the primary role that Pilate had as prefect or governor was to ensure that the taxes were collected and that peace was maintained. In fact, Pilate left kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the local towns and villages under local control. As long as you would pay your tax and as long as you would not foment a revolution, Pilate would just kind of let you do whatever it is you wanted to do within reason. 
There was only one other position in all of Judea that the governor personally appointed. Every other town and village and city and, and municipality could kind of elect or appoint their own leaders. There was only one other position in all of Judea that the governor personally appointed. And that was the position of high priest. The high priest of the temple in Jerusalem was a personal appointment by the Roman governor because the Roman authorities knew how important the temple was to keeping the Jewish population under control. Now Pilate, in the year 26 AD when he was made governor, he actually inherited the sitting high priest, Caiaphas. Caiaphas had married into a high priestly family himself, and he and his family had kind of maintained uh, control over the high priesthood for several years at that point. And while Pilate didn't particularly care for Caiaphas, Caiaphas did the job, which was to keep the people under control. And in that, we finally have the encounter where Pilate quite unexpectedly, meets Jesus. And the reason why I say unexpectedly is that when Pilate meets Jesus, he's not impressed. And he begins to wonder if there's something else going on. I want to read to you that story, a passage that we uh, touched on a few weeks ago during the season of Lent. Uh, but it's from the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Luke this encounter between Pilate and Jesus. Pilate called together the chief priests and leaders of the people and said to them, You have brought me this man as one who is perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged, and released. But then all, all the crowd shouted together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept on shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And then he handed Jesus over as they wished. In this moment where Pilate meets Jesus for the first and only time, Caiaphas has brought Jesus to Pilate because Caiaphas needs help. I imagine Pilate was intrigued that Caiaphas, the high priest of the Jewish people, would seek out Pilate for help in a situation. And come to find out what Caiaphas needs is permission to execute Jesus. At this point in time, the Romans had the authority over capital punishment, and the Jewish people could not legally put someone to death without Rome's permission. And Caiaphas comes and tells Pilate, I have a notorious criminal, someone really bad that you're going to want to make sure that we do away with. In fact, he's been teaching people not to pay their taxes and teaching them that he's the king and not the emperor. Now, remember way back in the beginning when I told you that Pilate really only had two main job responsibilities, keep the peace and collect the tax? And here comes Caiaphas saying, we have a criminal here who's been telling people to revolt and to not pay their taxes. You can see why it would get Pilate's attention. But then when he meets Jesus, he doesn't find any threat in him. He's intrigued. He's kind of confused and certainly doesn't know what to do with this Jesus who, whatever he is, is no threat to Rome. He, in fact, shuffles him off to Herod, the son of the great King Herod who's ruling in the north over in Galilee. 
Herod doesn't really know what to do with him either, and he sends him back to Pilate. And they spend this time kind of shuffling Jesus back and forth. Clearly, no one really worried about him, but no one really wanting to make a decision about him either. And so Pilate begins to suspect that Caiaphas and the others have some ulterior motives. And so he decides to appeal directly to the people. He tells the people, this guy's not done anything wrong. I find no fault or guilt in him. I'm going to, you know, I'll flog him and then release him. And um, instead, I'll put to death this really bad criminal that we arrested named Barabbas. And of course, the high priests are already prepared for this. They've circulated in the crowd and begin to spread the chant to release Barabbas instead. Pilate then asks, well, what am I supposed to do with Jesus? And the crowd begins to chant, crucify, crucify, crucify. Their shouts get louder. They begin to stomp their feet. Pilate fears that a riot's going to break out. And he finally decides that he's done with all of these petty squabbles among the leaders of Jerusalem. He's tired and ready to be done with this Jesus, whoever he is. And he tells the people that he's washing his hands of the whole situation. And if they want death so bad, they can have it. He turns to his men and tells them to put Jesus to death. What we see here is what happens at the intersection of religion and politics. Jesus finds himself in the midst of a debate between the leaders of Jerusalem who were not only threatened by Rome, but also felt threatened by Jesus. They had spent most of their lives in this delicate balance between trying not to get Rome mad at them and trying to honor their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus doesn't seem to want to follow them, nor is Jesus interested in making nice with Rome. Jesus is faithful to his Father. And that often brings him into conflict not only with the leaders of Jerusalem, but with the powers of Rome itself. You see, at the, end, at the center of the Apostles' Creed, at the heart of this statement of faith, is a declaration that the central event of the story of Jesus is a moment in which religion and politics crashed into each other. Now, that means that Christian folk shouldn't shy away from talk about religion and politics. But it also means that we don't have to talk about religion and politics in the same way the world does. Because we are followers of Christ. And so we're not meant to avoid politics or shy away from important conversations about morality and ethics and justice and war and peace. But it does mean that the way that we talk about these things, the manner of our engagement, the way that we treat our friends should be different than the world around us. We don't have to live in the extremes between Rome and the high priests. We can live in the center with Jesus. But remember that Jesus teaches us a different way of living. You probably have heard the old phrase that politics makes strange bedfellows. You ever heard that? <laughs> that sometimes uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. We actually see that here in the story of Jesus. Jesus managed to unite the Romans, the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, 
the temple priests and scribes, he united all of them who hated each other, but united them in their hatred of him. Politics makes strange bedfellows sometimes. And it seems that they all want Jesus out of the picture, but none of them really want the responsibility. And so they begin to shuffle and work behind the scenes to collaborate so that finally Jesus is out of the picture. You know, sometimes when we're doing a Bible study on this text, I get asked the question, who truly is responsible for the death of Jesus? Is it Pilate? I mean, he's there right in the creed. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Oh, was it Caiaphas? Was it the Pharisees and Sadducees? Was it the crowd, the mob that day, that cried out for his death? Who's really to blame for Jesus' death? That can kind of be a political statement or a political question. But I don't particularly like it as a question. In fact, I think there's a, another question that's altogether different that I want us to answer. Not who's to blame for Jesus' death, but who is forgiven in Jesus' death? I think that's a better question. And there's an easier answer. Everyone. Everyone is offered forgiveness in the death of Jesus. And that puts everyone on the same footing. Caiaphas, Pilate, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the mob, the crowd, the disciples who fled, the disciples who stayed. Everyone is the same at the foot of the cross. There are no political parties, no differences. There are no one who's more or less righteous, better or worse, more deserving or less deserving of forgiveness. And it means that no matter what I've done, I too can be forgiven because Jesus suffered, was crucified, died, and was buried. And that can kind of be challenging, too. Because it does mean that if we're all equal at the foot of the cross, then we have to look at each other in much differently than the world tries to teach us. Now, you may be wondering, like I am, how I'm going to fit hell into this sermon and what it has to do with anything. Well, I'm glad you asked that. Some of the more astute theologians out there may have noticed that in older versions or in different versions of the Apostles' Creed, uh, there's a line added to the end of that creed, that statement rather. Uh, some versions of the Apostles' Creed will say this, that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried, and he descended into hell. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, part of it comes from a, a small passage, really just a few sentences from 1 Peter, in which Peter says that in the death of Jesus, Jesus goes into Sheol and proclaims the gospel to the dead. Now, this isn't really an extended Bible study on that passage, but just hear me out. In the old Hebrew mind of understanding, Sheol was the place of the dead. It's where everyone went, good or bad. You went to the place of the dead. And it wasn't until the resurrection of Jesus that we began to understand God's desire for paradise and God's desire for eternal relationship with us. Prior to Jesus, this concept that in death we simply go to Sheol was what people understood and believed in. And in 1 Peter, we're told that in Jesus' death, he goes to the dead. And to the ancestors, the forerunners, he proclaims the good news that death is defeated and they get to go to live with God. Well, Sheol in Hebrew gets translated into the Greek Hades, 
which simply means place of the dead. Hades then gets translated into to Latin inferna, which meant place of the dead. And then inferna gets translated into English hell. And a lot of people get confused. So us Methodists back in 1792 decided to try to fix the confusion and we just took that part out of the creed. Well, now it makes it a little bit more confusing. In fact, if you have a hymnal, you can turn to the hymnal, United Methodist hymnal, and see that we then tried to fix the problem again by putting a little asterisk beside it with a little small print that said, hey, it used to say he went to hell. In any event, this is what it means. That when Jesus died, he was buried in the ground, just like everybody else has, and everybody else will be. In fact, one of the things that makes us all human is that we all die. So did Jesus. But what's also true is that even though death came for Jesus, Jesus defeated death. And he came chasing after us. Now, if this sermon has felt all over the place and disjointed and like it made no sense, well, that's kind of the point. Because when we get into debates between religion and politics and who's right and who's wrong and who's better and who's worse, friends, it doesn't make sense. Because we are all human. And as much as we want to separate ourselves into Romans and non-Romans, Sadducees and Pharisees, Herodians and Israelites, Republicans and Democrats, Americans and non. Those are all divisions that we've made up. And those are divisions which will often lead to death. Jesus found himself in the midst of that division. But he also stayed faithful to his Father. And he overcame those divisions when in the crucifixion he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He even went to the dead to defeat death on its home turf. So the next time that you have the opportunity to say that line in the creed, that we believe that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, remember, that's not the end of the story. And it's not the end for us either. So the next time you find yourself in a debate with someone who disagrees with you politically, make your case, speak your truth, but then remember, Jesus died for all of us. And that should change everything in the world. Amen. Well, friends, as you go forth into this week, remember that the Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift His countenance to you and give you peace. And go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>